Welcome back. I'm Roy with Rugged Badger Racing and Team Parts Badger. This is our 80 hours to Gingerman Champ Car. Now, we are all ready to get packed up and head to the track. So now is a great time to talk about how long this project actually took. Now we had about 80 hours of time myself to dedicate to this particular project without burning the midnight oil, without pushing myself on weekends and trying to scrimp and squeeze time everywhere. So we didn't necessarily make it within 80 hours. We actually took 141 hours to get this car ready to go to the track and we're still not done. We're actually bleeding the brakes right now, doing some final taping so that we can load up and then head to Gingerman. Now, let me walk you through the car and let you know what we did. All right, so first off, the car looks a hell of a lot better. Um, and the reason that is, Brandon spent a ton of time here getting the car ready, getting this thing painted, and we just got the decals on today. So that took, in total, I think we had about eight hours dedicated to that. Now, talking about the suspension itself, so all of the bushings have been replaced with Delrin bushings. That took substantially longer than I wanted it to. It took way longer, but I'm really happy with how that turned out. Now, suspension-wise, we also got this corner-weighted and aligned. Now, talking about brakes, we have brand new brakes in the rear and the front of the car. In the front of the car, we went with the Brofab 11.75 inch kit. In the rear, we have the Sport Rotor with a kit that we made using a Dyna Pro single caliper. Now, we are probably gonna change that by next race to a Powerlight caliper, or maybe we'll actually move to the Dyna Pro, and I'll do something a little creative there, we'll see. Now for shocks, we took the Fat Cat shocks out of the car. We replaced those with Penske's up front and we have Bilstein's in the back. Now with the Bilstein's in the back, we couldn't afford the points to run a coil over suspension. So we had to run a normal coil spring that's similar to OE diameter. We ended up choosing Fly Me Out of Springs and we're using the front spring in the rear of the car. Now, this car is a little bit higher than the typical Miata and actually it's a little bit higher than I've wanted but I think it's gonna be really compliant on the track and it's a good baseline to start out and we'll see where we're at. Now for bump stops in the front, we have 5X Racing black bump stops. In the rear, we have the yellow and the blue combined, hopefully to make up for some spring rate because of flying me out of spring, it's progressive, but it's about 330 pounds. We want the rear to be about 400, 450 pounds. So that's it for A-arms, that's it for brakes and suspension. Let me move on to other parts of the car. Now with the engine, this thing has been a whirlwind. So we initially got the car with a blown motor. It had rod knock, so we pulled the motor. Uh, we went to prepare the new motor, but we noticed there was a flatness issue with the oil pan. We did not feel confident we would get a seal on the oil pan. So Nick here spent a ton of hours, I'm not including that in the project, but he took a ton of hours getting a new oil pan designed, and then the shop went ahead and made a brand new oil pan for us. That oil pan is in the garage right here. Now, why is it in the garage, not in the car? Because in the car, we actually have a second revision of the oil pan. We had to shake the car down again and go through, and we believe that this other oil pan is gonna be much better for us so we don't get oil starved. We were having some really weird issues on the first pan that I thought was related to the pickup tube not sealing. Wasn't that issue at all. It actually is the pickup tube location, and we were just rushing on that, and we thought we would have more pickup options on the market. We actually bought about like 50 of them, but we couldn't find one to fit. Now, the new pan has an all-new uh, machined pickup tube system. So we know we have flatness, and this thing performs really well. Um, we'll see about corners. I am a little concerned about whether or not we starve in corners because I have no trap doors or baffling. I wanted to make this something that uh, would replicate the OE design as much as possible. Maybe we'll have to add that on the next revision. Now, when getting the motor in and out, we also had issues for clearance. So with the new oil pan, it wasn't clearing the NB steering rack that was in the car. At the same time that was taking place, we learned about a rule clarification on another team that the MB subframe is actually points, and I wanted to get that thing replaced anyway. So we swapped that out. We have an NA steering rack, an NA subframe in the car, and that for the most part resolves some of our clearance issues. Now we still have a little bit on the pan, so we raised the motor, but overall, uh, this has been a nightmare. Uh, it's been an absolute nightmare uh, getting the motor and that burned a ton of time, especially troubleshooting. I forgot a cable, which I think burned about six hours. Now, let me move on to lights. 
All right, so here are the lights of the car. Now we're actually fitting two lights in the turn signal area of the car. Now I was so happy when I did this. It took me forever to wire these up and get these fitted. I spent about 14 hours. I fitted them with a bumper that came with the car and I was really happy because they were sitting behind the lens. As soon as we put our bumper on, they no longer fit behind the lens. And I had to create these holes, which really sucked. And the reason is that our bumper is actually being pulled down a lot more than the other one, because I believe we've used this bumper for like three or four seasons. This has been on the car a very long time. And over time, I think the heat and the pressure has just pulled this down, especially the downforce. Um, Cause you have at least a hundred pounds of downforce. I'm gonna say maybe a thousand now, uh, but maybe like 200 pounds of downforce um, with the splitter ramps on this at, at full clip, really pulling that thing down. So uh, overall, the lights was a nightmare. And in the back, I have the little lights here. Now you'll see the ones up here are actually blocked a little bit by the trunk lid because I didn't put them on with the trunk lid on. So that kind of sucks. I'm gonna have to reposition those in the future. Nonetheless, that's done. The only thing left from an electrical perspective and lighting is I really wanna wire a redundant circuit for the brakes. Obviously, there's not enough time to do that. Fingers crossed, I do have replacement bulbs coming in LED bulbs, which I'm hoping are gonna be more reliable. All right, moving on to other parts. All right, so interior of the car, we recharged the fire system. We got the passenger seat out, and then we got the passenger seat back in. And the reason we did that, we had to get clearance for the fire system. I also wanted to replace the belts. So we put our brand new or newer Schroff belts in that have a much later date on them. And we took these in date belts, moved them to the passenger side. And we also added a window net on the passenger side. So the passenger side is 100% legal, just like the driver's side. That's gonna allow us to have passengers at tons of tracks because I want Nick to be a passenger and I wanna be a passenger with him, get him up to speed as much as possible. And it's always great driving with other people. So if we have other drivers in the car, it'd be great to drive along. So I'm happy that we have that option. Now in the interior of the car, we have our light switches right here, which we have those Sharpie and hopefully we have labels. But overall, we didn't change a whole lot. Um, I did remount the AIM because when I went to update the firmware on the AIM, I actually bricked the unit and I did remote support with AIM. They were super helpful. I worked with Jaden out of California, ultra responsive. We overnighted that and he overnighted it back Saturday delivery because we needed to test that when we got our new oil pan on and everything worked out perfectly. I got to tell you, I'm super happy with AIM and the support that they've offered. Um, now from a radio perspective, we are going to go with the Motorola radio. We we're really struggling to try to uh, figure that out on our own. And Brandon worked with, who did you work with? Uh, Charlie over at Racing Radios. Yeah. And how's that been so far? It's actually been great. A really great experience. It was a lot faster to, to do that than try to try to learn radios myself. Awesome. Yeah. Now I'm really excited because we've never had a good radio in the car. We use the Chinese crap um, and it's always staticky. It's always a problem and you're in a high anxiety, high stress environment while you're racing. And if you don't have clear communications, it's really frustrating. Now, what I'm not happy about is even though this had the Motorola radio installed, it was still really expensive. Um, I'm not gonna say the amount, but thank God the support was there. Um, I think Charlie makes it worth it. So fingers crossed that that thing really performs on the track. Um, something else here, we did swap out the, the cool shirt that's in the truck trunk. Let's see here. Yeah, that's that's about it in the interior of the car. Uh, not a whole lot else uh, changed from that perspective. A lot of troubleshooting with the wiring, but overall didn't change a whole lot. I did take out some, some extra stuff that was added. Uh, let's move on. All right, now let's talk a little bit about the splitter and radiator ducting. Again, I took a ton of time, but I'm really happy with how it turned out. So I have the radiator ducting all sealed and you see this weather stripping. Now I had to go through three different attempts with different weather stripping to find this stuff. Uh, which is pretty expensive, but it actually expands from three eighths of an inch up to an inch and a half. And it formed this really nice seal all the way around the radiator. And then you can see here, I have this nice duct. And what I did is I created a nice curve here so the air can stay attached as it goes to the bottom of the radiator. That air is gonna be attached up here. It gets a mess anyway. I don't really care about attachment on the top, but if I can keep that air attached on the bottom, I'm gonna have really nice efficiency. Now the hood doesn't have any venting in it because we didn't have enough time, but ideally we would have a lot of hood vents to really get that under hood pressure taken care of. Now you'll notice on the back of the hood, we do have tape on the cowl. And the idea here is that we're actually sealing this really nice high pressure area in front of the windshield. And that stops that high pressure from flowing back um, under the hood and really counteracting what we're doing at the front of the car and with the radiator. So at a minimum, we don't have venting, but we do have that. 
Now, now for spars, I have professional awesome spars here, um, holding this together with the parts badger style splitter. And I'm really happy with this. And Miller here is working on this intake system. So we actually have this nice uh, air intake that can build a positive pressure and you can see the filter behind. So if it rains, the water's gonna hit and flow down and drain, um, but you can still get a nice high pressure area right where that filter is and it's gonna be cold air. I'm super happy about that. Now, talking about hubs. Now, I did replace the hubs. It came with a really weird combination of the wrong casting hubs, and it also came with some Yada hubs, but all the bolts are stripped. I actually did get all those bolts out. I just used the Dremel to cut a slot and then uh, got those out, but the rebuild kits are just so expensive. So I sent our hubs out to uh, Final Turn Motorsports down in Florida. Um, he took care of me, he, get, he got those rebuilt, got studs pressed in, and then I put the extended studs in the rear as well, made sure those are all good to go. So from a, a suspension drivetrain perspective, we replaced the front subframe, the steering rack, the bushings, some of the A-arms, all the ball joints are good. The hubs, uh, the brakes, the shocks. So pretty much everything suspension wise, it's a whole new car. Even the subframes changed, the end links changed, um, got a whole lot. Now, drivetrain wise, right? We got a new engine, we got a new clutch, we got a new transmission. I am using the existing drive shaft and we do have a risk as it relates to the differential because I don't know the condition, but on the street, it seems fine. So fingers crossed that that's gonna be okay. Now, moving on to all of our bins here. So when we get loaded up, uh, we actually have this really nice shelving system. And when I say really nice, I mean hacked together quickly, like everything else. Um, but we put a bunch of bins up here and then we have a front system as well. And we can load up about, I think 12 or 16 bins in the front. And then we can load up this with another 10 bins or so. Now this car is higher than the last one. So I actually had to use, normally we use two by fours that are flat. I actually use two by sixes and I notched them so we can get the extra clearance because when we put weight, it's actually gonna hit the car. Um, and we don't want that. So all these bins are gonna get going. All these tires are gonna get going. Um, the spare transmission, the spare engine, and then I have a spare differential, I have a casing, and then I also uh, have the differential itself, the, the front piece. Now, unfortunately, that is an open differential. I didn't have enough time to get a torse in together, but if we blow it, that's a price we're gonna pay. We'll have to run an open. Now, when we look at all our bins here, I do have these color-coded with duct tape and everything labeled. So anything that's related to a spare part or a consumable is labeled in a specific color. Tools are labeled in blue. Everything else is labeled here in uh, yellow, unless it goes in the pits. And if it's pit, it's in green. We also have some stuff that uh, is related to like gear, stuff for the trailer. Um, that is pink. Um, and that really helps because we have a lot of people moving these bins around. I can just tell them, hey, these colors go here, these colors go there. And it's really easy to get this thing sorted. Now for wheels, we have RS4s on the car. They are old RS4s on old rims. Pretty much all of our rims are old and they are in rough shape overall. Um, but we have six RS4s. We're gonna use those just for testing. Now for running, we are gonna go with the Nankang and we have the, uh, I think the CRS. Now these are version twos. Version one, I think has a pretty bad rap because it was quick. Um, but it really wore fast and you couldn't really use it for an endurance application. Now there was some additional testing that Andy Hollis did in Grassroot Motorsports. And he said version two of these are substantially better. Not only are they faster, but they fix the wear problem. And these wear um, a lot more similarly to I think the, the 660s and better than the RE71 RSs that are out there. So we're gonna give these a try. We have eight tires. Hopefully that's enough to get through the two races. For the test day, we're mainly gonna be running the RS4s. Now, I do have one set that's heat cycled. The other set is not heat cycled. So on our test day, we are gonna heat cycle that. We're gonna run that on Sunday or hopefully later in the day um, on Saturday if we really had to, just so they can sit for that roughly 24 hours or so. And the reason was Tire Rack only had four in one location with the heat cycling. The other four were at a different location. But we're gonna go ahead and get all of these bins loaded up. We got a couple more bins in the garage here. Um, stuff is a little chaotic right now, um, but I'm gonna be really happy when everything's in the trailer, everything's buttoned up tight and I can sleep well, uh, get some rest before we head to the track. 
All right, we're gonna call that a wrap. We have everything packed up here. Uh, you see uh, our tires loaded. We have the Nankangs in the follow-up video. We're gonna be talking about how those perform during the race. Uh, we have our spare motor, spare transmission, differential. We go around to the front and bins, bins, bins. We have a lot of bins. We actually were able to fit 18 bins in this uh, initial row here. Plus we have another 10 or so behind, along with axles, power plant frame, everything like that. Our tooling and generator uh, goes up front. Uh, we're gonna be loading that in a little bit later because we still have to change out tires uh, on the Lotus, which is in front of the Eclipse there. Um, so we are gonna be testing that on the test day. We're gonna get Miller in the car, uh, see how he performs. Uh, we're picking the Lotus because it has all the stability control and we can progressively turn that off to see how he performs. We also have uh, rain tires on my Street Miata. Uh, which is tucked away from winter storage. That's gonna come out right after this race, but I gotta get those tires out tomorrow, get them loaded up. Now the tires that are on my street Miata, which is a turbo Miata, are the same exact tires that won at Road Atlanta as well. That was our first win in 2020. So hopefully those are lucky tires. They can bring us some magic just in case it rains uh, at Gingerman and we can win again. So I sincerely appreciate everybody for following along with the build and watching. Again, please remember to like and subscribe. You got a lot of good videos coming, especially resources, talking about the brakes, tires, things like that. Stay tuned.